Good morning, all of you. <clears throat> Welcome to the uh, penultimate day of the Tangled Bank workshop. Tomorrow we are concluding the workshop with valedictory function. So only one more day to go. In fact, two more days. Next in this series is Dr. Subramanian K. A. And he's going to talk on exciting world of dragonflies and damselflies right now at eleven o'clock. And after his talk, it's going to be Dr. Rajiv Rakhavan. He's going to talk on endemic fishes of uh, uh, you know the uh, Western cuts, especially in the freshwater ecosystems on India, but special focus is on the Western cuts. Dr. Subramanian K. A. is working at the ZSI, Zoological Survey of India, as Scientist E. He did his PhD from Madurai Kamaraj University in Tamil Nadu, and he is a specialist in Ephemeroptera, that is mayflies, Odonata, that is dragonflies and damselflies, and Hemiptera, that is aquatic bugs. And he's also working on freshwater biodiversity conservation. He has discovered several new species of aquatic insects, including mayflies, dragonflies, and aquatic bugs. He is also a member of International Union for Conservation of Nature, that is IUCN, or Donata Specialist Group, IUCN South Asia Invertebrate Specialist Group, and Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that is IPBES. A very productive researcher, uh, 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 Dr. Subramanian K. We are really happy for you, sir, uh, to be here. I, I welcome you. Warmly, I welcome you, uh, uh, you for agreeing to be part of this Tangled Bank series. You may start your talk now. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Flix. So I'll just uh, activate my talk. Uh, can you see the slides? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Okay. Yes. You have to click the share screen yeah, yeah. and. Yeah, now I think you can see the slides. Yes, uh, now I can see. Please make it full screen. Yeah. So uh, you all may be very well aware of uh, dragonflies and damselflies, which is very common in India and especially in tropics. But many of us may not know that uh, dra for the, the fascination for us for the dragonflies and damselflies is very innate. I think we are from childhood itself, we are very much fascinated about dragonflies and damselflies. I think that is because of our ancient evolutionary connection with this group of insects. The, this is one of the oldest living organisms or oldest living organisms which still fly around. And this is one of the first organisms which uh, which developed the uh, mastery over flight and which developed the technique of flying in, in all the living organisms, which mastered the technique of flight. So this is one of the oldest, um, this is a depiction of the fossil, graphic depiction of the fossil dragonfly. This is called the uh, Meganeuropsis uh, permiana. This is about 300 million years ago, this was flying around. And this was the largest known insect in the whole uh, world from uh, from the evolution of the earth from diapterid. So the wingspan was more than uh, two feet, and you can see a picture of it comparing with the uh, human being. So this was so big, and over the years, the size of the dragonflies have reduced considerably. And this is supposed to be uh, these are all fossils of dragonflies. So the over the years, the size of the dragonflies have reduced, but the overall morphology and behavior has not changed much. That is what the Fossils tell us now also the, the same morphology of dragonflies and damselflies you can see, but the size has reduced. And it is hypothesized that this reduction in size is due to reduction in oxygen level in the atmosphere over the millions of years. We also have a dragonfly fossils uh, recovered from uh, near India. This is from Burmese damselfly and fossils indicating that the Indian fauna, the, what the Indian fauna of dragonflies and damselflies, what we see here are much ancient. And then many of them have Gondwanian origin. You may be heard of uh, Gondwanian landscape. So these are some of the damselfly fossils recovered from amber in Myanmar. So these are very recent studies. So you may be knowing that the dragonflies and damselflies, the call of class Odonata, is uh, largely comprised of two groups. That is, there's uh, 
dragon flies which sit when with the wings spread and the damsel flies which hold over the wings over their thorax and this is uh, evolutionarily very significant in the sense that these are all called paleoptera so these are these dragon flies damsel flies and may flies together form a group called paleoptera in the insect evolution and these paleoptera are the insects which cannot hold wings over their thorax like if you see a beetle or a bug or any or a fly you can see that the wings are horizontally folded over their thorax and dragon flies and damsel flies they cannot fold the wings horizontally but this is folded vertically over their thorax this this is uh, this the why i am saying that this um, evolutionarily this is very important because that once you can fold the wings over their thorax horizontally you can occupy spaces which is crevices cracks small habitats you can occupy and dragon flies and damsel flies they are they have to fly because they cannot fold their wings and hide in small places so they are very prominent and very easily uh, found in field and there is another group of dragon flies this is only uh, relic this is a living fossil which is called the uh, anisocygoptera and we have one species in himalaya that is epiophilia laidlowi and other two species are found in japan and china so this this is found in very high altitude in india and there is only three extant species but in olden times there were several species of this group but but now this is only living fossils which is found in and the ancestors of these are found during carboniferous so this is one of the uh, very significant uh, fauna what is found in himalaya this is called epiophilia laidlowi the most characteristic feature of dragon flies is its wings i uh, already told you they cannot fold their wings over their thorax horizontally but they can be folded in and uh, ver uh, vertically in damsel flies but dragon flies keeps their wings stretched and the difference between uh, other insects and dragon fly insects dragon flies is that these are all having i uh, already told they are called paleoptera the wing muscles the wing muscles are directly attached to the wing bases so the each wing can be independently moved like unlike other other like for example butterflies or a honey bee the wings are coupled so the whole fore wing and hind wings are coupled together so when they beat they beat in unison but in dragon flies and the damsel flies these wings are not coupled and they don't beat in unison and this gives them a great advantage of flight and if you see the just this is a just a uh, depiction of the flight capabilities of different insect groups so large ashenid dragon flies like the on the uh, left this one uh, the uh, anax indicus can fly about more than 15 km per hour but like small uh, damsel flies they fly about 3 km per hour but our common insects like our wasp fly about 12 km per hour per hour or a like our butterfly like this they fly about 5 km per hour so they have a huge uh, flight capability and they can travel long distances other very important and characteristic feature of dragon flies is that their vision so they like we you we have three chromophores uh, uh, chromatids called these are called chromophores that i color so like rgb we see the world with three colors like red green and blue and most of the organisms most of the organisms can see in three colors vertebrates for example but invertebrates like other insects butterflies they also see in ultraviolet and infrared so they have they can see five colors but recent uh, uh, studies shows that many of the dragon flies and damsel flies they and based on their group or taxonomy there are 15 to 30 uh, chromophores that is called opsins and these opsins they give a very great advantage in seeing the world so they see the world in much more brighter color so their resolution of vision is less but they see much more color and another thing they use is that what is called as motion camouflage so motion camouflage is a technique of hunting so when the prey feels that the predator is not moving but actually it is a mechanism of flight and the color of the dragon fly which makes the which makes feel the prey that the predator is not moving so they easily capture the prey in flight so because of their this motion camouflage and their great flight abilities they can capture the prey 
in flight and the more all the dragonflies and damselflies catch their prey in flight and they use their legs as a basket to hold the prey and eat eat it so why we study uh, dragonflies or damselflies or other aquatic insects is that they are very important component in food web so they are very 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 important component in food web their larva is used as something and they are very easy to sample and study to do lot of ecological or uh, studies we can they can easily be sampled and study you don't need much uh, effort or you don't need many techniques and if you want a field notebook and binocular or some camera is enough to study them and they are very fruit for several vertebrates and invertebrates and they are biogeographical link studies i already told you some of them are really ancient and they are having very high uh, restricted range several species so they are easy to study and they have very distinct habitat preference so each and every dragonfly or a damselfly have a very distinct habitat preference so which can be uh, which can be used in studies and they are good indicators of environmental pollution and stress and they are also predators of aquatic animals fishes etc so they live in all the habitats aquatic habitats you can see them hill streams wetlands agro ecosystems forest canopies etc so but they are found throughout the world except in uh, poles like antarctica and antarctica you don't see dragonflies or damselflies because it is too cold for them. so and they don't have, they require uh, uh like uh, warmth so you see maximum diversity in the tropics so in the temperate areas you don't see much similarly in, in himalayas also in the higher himalayas like trans himalayas where it is very cold you see only uh, one or two dragonflies one or two species but if you go to eastern himalaya or western ghats you can nearly see them 200 species of dragonflies so generally like all other groups you have less diversity in colder areas and much more higher diversity in uh, warmer areas then again here the forest areas with a lot of streams hill streams have much more species than the areas were plains like for gangetic plains or in the coastal areas you have less number of species than what you see in forested areas so other characteristic feature of this are they have very clear uh, sexual dimorphism like similar to what we see in uh, vertebrates or birds uh, or mammals they have very clear sexual dimorphism it is expected as they are very visual in their communication so males are very brightly colored and other than the and the females are very drab colored and no. and other interesting feature is the territoriality so the males guard a territory especially near what aquatic habitat especially near their breeding habitat they guard a very well defined territory and they actively patrol that territory and they chase away all the uh, other dragonflies and damselflies or dragonflies or damselflies especially of their own species like what the birds and other mammals do and this is a, this is usually this is we see dragonflies and damselflies perch in their territory so they are very brightly and very truly uh, attractively colored so this is a damselfly and this is dragonfly this is how we see in field actively searching in a very prominent uh, landmark they will be sitting and uh, guarding their territory and other interesting thing is they have elaborate courtship displays like um, dancer this you can see this male displaying the bright colored wings to females to attract so in the when the when the female visit the territory of the male they show all these courtship displays to very elaborate courtship display especially these groups of dragonflies and damselflies and they get attracted to it and another interesting aspect of this dragonflies and damselflies is their uh, mating behavior so uh, they have secondary genitalia unlike other insects where the uh, the genitalia is at the end of the last abdominal segment they have a secondary genitalia in the second abdominal segment so sperm is transferred from last abdominal though the gonad gonads are there in the last abdominal segment the sp sperm before mating or during mating is transferred from last abdominal segment to the second abdominal segment and stored there and females get attached to the, this kind this you might have seen in the field also how the males and females fly together females take the uh, sperm from the second abdominal segment of the male and this is called secondary genitalia and the secondary genitalia is highly evolved and it is an under high selection pressure and this has elaborate uh, morphological features so that to remove the already sometimes the females might have already mated with other male so it it removes the sperm from already mated male 
and it tries to fertilize the eggs. So there is a, uh, you might have heard about the uh, theories about sperm competition, other thing. This was dancing flies were used as a model system to study the sperm competition in a calotrix part of uh, dancer flies. So this has a very, uh, very complicated structures are developed for mating in the second genitalia. And egg laying. So most of the damsel flies uh, lay eggs in decaying vegetations or uh, dead wood or other thing. But dragonflies usually lay egg in open water or some of some groups like they lay roots or the trees and other thing. And they develop into what is called as a larva. Earlier they were called nayars. So the damsel flies larva have caudal filaments and the like caudal gills, what we call. And dragonfly larva on the right hand side, they have caudal gills and this caudal film and so the morphologically they are very different i'll show you the photos also and they have that this is a dragonfly larva and the mouth part is very well evolved and very well developed and this is a predator so this is an aquatic predator and it actively predates the uh, small uh, tadpoles fishes and other aquatic invertebrates and other aquatic insects and the mouth part is like developed as a, a, a dagger and a this one to catch and eat the prey so this, this is how the lateral view of the mouth part and it suddenly uh, throws out the mouth part to catch and capture the prey. So once the larval duration is completed, it may have 11 to 12 molds, molting and it may take about more like about two months to uh, one year to complete. Some species even take two years to complete and they emerge as adults. So they, as soon as they emerge, adult is emerged. They are not very brightly colored and wings are not fully developed. It takes some time for them to uh, dry the wings and but they will fly uh, as soon as the sun rises. But it will take some more time, few weeks to develop the color. And they will, once their full color is developed and fully mature, they will return to their uh, breeding habitat and try to occupy a space and they will guard the territory. So adults are uh, predators. So adults feed on a variety of flying insects and big dragonflies even feed on a uh, small uh, dragonflies and damselflies and they are actively predators I already discussed with you and their vision and their flying technique uh, is very useful in nature. and they have like several uh, predators and parasites the so birds are one of the major predators and uh, the larva is also predated upon by birds and this larva is also intermediate host for some uh, nematode parasites and which which birds get infected and you can see here on the like small black dots these are all parasitic mites which is uh, attached to the uh, damselflies you might have seen you may see also this is very common in uh, uh, damselflies and dragonflies so these are all aquatic mites so what they do is that uh, when they're during the larval stage or when the dragonfly emerges from the water they get attached to the adult body of the dragonflies and they get transported free of cost to other aquatic water bodies. But they also get a feeding, they also feed on the hemolymph of the damselflies. Other insects like these uh, robber flies are good predators of dragonflies. Then you have the spiders. So many dragonflies get entangled in cobwebs and they feed on this one, dragonflies. And another um, fascinating aspect of uh, dragonflies is the migration. So you might have seen the large uh, uh, migrating uh, swarms of dragonflies immediately after monsoon. So what they do is that you, it is usually one species called the uh, Pandala flevisans. So they use the monsoon wind to travel across the subcontinent. So this species is found throughout the tropics, even the remote oceanic islands, this species is found. This is have a circumtropical uh, distribution. And they use these uh, tropical winds. It is called intertropical convergence zones. So, which oscillate between the tropics. Like from uh, during summer, it moves from the southwest to the northeast. So that is how the monsoon winds are pulled uh, from the Indian Ocean to the across Indian subcontinent. And during the November, December, it comes back from that is called the northeast monsoon. So they use these uh, trade winds or monsoon winds, intertropical convergence zone winds to move across Indian subcontinent. So it is not an active migration as you see in birds, like birds do active migration. So they use active migration, but these are not passive migrants, which uses that monsoon winds to move across Indian subcontinent. And it is not the same individual that is coming back to the uh, migrating. 
so they they have very short life cycle and 50 in 50 days they complete the life cycle and they move from one place to another one population is moving from one place to another and uh, like you might have heard about the recent movement of low cost also across indian uh, subcontinent and this the low cost uh, population movements is also a sort of um, swarming migration and and that happens it periodically so last a uh, swarming was about 27 years ago but periodic uh, every let us say we can say roughly about every 30 years there is this swarming of low cost happening and that starts from that is due to climatic factors like that the population build up of this happens and they move from uh, east africa across indian subcontinent all to all the dry belt and this happens every roughly about every 30 years so this is cystocerca gregaria that is a species of crested locus so that moves and but the population of the cystocerca gregaria always is there in small pockets and small numbers throughout the year so even in india we have in the western india even if there is no swarming of this large swarming there is a small population always there because that is a natural distribution of the species but in every like a periodically every 30 years or something this uh, population builds up due to uh rain for pattern changes and other thing and they move so this this will be there for another one or two years and again it will die out so this is a natural uh population build up that happens in uh, schistosarca gregaria and how many dragon flies and damsel flies are there i'll just give please we are running out of time so we have about uh, 493 species of dragon flies and damsel flies of india in india but still uh, people are discovering new species every year few species are added to it so soon we will be reaching about uh, 500 species of dragon flies in india and these are some of the major groups of dragon flies and damsel flies just to show you the diversity of the groups so these are all damsel flies these are all uh, cindy listed here these are very colorful and brightly colored platistic tits uh, uh, then you have this uh, uh, calopter uh, dragon flies then you have a uh, chlorocyphids then you have you feed a these are all stream dwelling damsel flies I already told you they are all very highly uh, diverse and this one then you have very brightly colored common species then some of these are uh, uh, high altitude dragon flies like ashena petalura then you have dragon flies big dragon flies in streams these are all stream dwelling dragon flies again dragon flies so what is the Uh, what is happening to dragon flies and damsel flies the major cause is that uh, human footprint so you may be like the, several studies have showed that the global decline in biodiversity either it be uh, terrestrial freshwater or marine ecosystem is due to uh, there are several uh, direct pressures like the habitat loss alteration fragmentation over exploitation of resources invasive species pollution uh, carbon dioxide climate change all these factors have contributing to Uh, especially due to our drivers like the, uh, our urban and industrial expansion overuse of water resources energy transport all these things have caused decline in biodiversity and it is true for dragon flies also several studies have shown that several of our species are uh, declining and it is under threat and to summarize the uh, the several studies global studies have shown that uh, freshwater biodiversity especially the indian subcontinent is under severe threat uh, due to and this is my st studies based on several taxa including dragon flies which have shown that the you can see that the indian subcontinent india indian indian subcontinent is in red due to severe pressure on uh, freshwater habitats and how that has declined the uh, freshwater biodiversity of the area so that is also affected uh, the very sensitive groups like the dragon flies and damsel flies so this has uh, affected very much so with this i will uh, stop now and we can take um, uh, questions and we can uh, yeah thank you so much uh, you know uh, dr subramanian i hope i really yeah, it's really wonderful and it's absolutely fantastic and you know you yeah. have covered so many things about the dragon flies you can exit your presentation window right now okay yeah you have uh, covered a lot of things including the migration sexual display and other ecological behavior fantastic overall uh, you know you have actually enlightened us with uh, uh, 
the current knowledge of uh, uh, you know in this uh, less known tax i would say that you know that the, the uh, odonata as well as uh, you have also touched upon the locust and other current issues i'll just uh, exit and you can yeah dr felix i think you left one points the picture yes, yes. quality of all these pictures which were used by the subramanam are very high qualities exactly i agree with you it is really hd hd quality picture and uh, yeah you i think you are you are a great you know the field biologist and you have, you have a tremendous experience covering lots of areas and yeah yeah congratulations sir and it was it was really wonderful and now let us go to the question section yes we have one question from uh, muzaffar muzaffar is from kashmir and he is asking what is economic importance of damsel flies and da dragon flies okay so the major economic importance is they are uh, controlling pests so mean several species are found in agro ecosystem and they are very good uh, control of pests as adult and, and as larva they are also very good uh, predators of mosquito larva so several flies they are used as uh, Uh, control of bio control of mosquitoes and other places and there are some species especially which is found in urban areas which is uh, used as uh, not efficiently but still they are very good control of pest control they are very good use and they have very good potential for pest control use and in in in, in with other uh, pest control really like it is not that you can only use dragon flies as pest control but they also have a lot of limitations so that you can be, especially you cannot breed dragon flies in a laboratory condition you can you cannot mass rear them and release in the field to control mosquito so they have they requires they are, they are so specialized that you need several uh, parameters to breed so only thing what people are doing now is to create habitats for uh, dragon flies in urban areas so that several dragon flies breed them in like gardens and other places so that forms a, a natural predator base for the control of noxious pest i think uh, dragon fly and the damp flies both, both are very important for the agro uh, eco ecology also yes uh, yes secondly been... what uh, i am confusing myself here what is the important role of the tail of the dragon fly and the damp fly during take off and the landing and is they is it is act as a signal to communicate with each other so the, like uh, i think the long tails of um, these insects is i think kind of a balancing to why when they do a flight maneuvering another thing it's kind of a, a, a balancing uh, mechanism and they also use it as a signal especially because uh, the bright colors they use it as a signal i think that evolved secondarily so primarily function of these long tails were uh, mechanistic so mostly for, for the flight maneuverability it's a just to do with aerodynamics and the way they uh, capture the prey in the uh, in flight so unlike other insects they they don't like uh, they don't feed on sitting insects or they don't uh, feed on feed on uh, insects which is uh, resting so they do everything in flight most of the time is spent in flight and their flight muscles are very well developed and it has the uh, maximum concentration of mitochondria in, i think in uh, all of the animal group so that uh, the, the energy is supplied very very quickly so it means they are also taking too much food for uh, such a high amount of the energy requirement yeah 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 they are taking too much they are they mostly feed on very small insects like mosquitoes and other things so we can't see them really so they do it everything in flight especially yeah. the large swarms of mosquito uh, dragon fly feed uh, in if you see uh, just after monsoon uh, above paddy field you can see large number of dragon flies and uh, in kerala we call it as onakumbi so just before onam you can see them in millions and they all be actively feeding on all these small small uh, agriculture pests and yeah felix yes so we have uh, now a question from reshma and uh, reshma is from mumbai she is asking is there any app based software for identification of dragon flies and damsel flies are there any citizen science initiative so it's a two part question huh. so app based applications uh, people have been developing but not like fully functional now so still in test stage maybe it will be one year or two years uh, people like even our some of our young friends in india they are developing so maybe in one or two years 
will have a full functional. So people are trying to use artificial intelligence algorithms to develop uh, this software. Uh, this app, app, this one. So uh, I think they will be they will be coming up with soon. And um, regarding the so citizen science initiative, there are several citizen science initiatives, and you will be surprised to know that from 2004, when the Yahoo group was there, from that time there is a very active Dragonfly India group. Now that is mo now mostly in the Facebook group with more than uh, 7,000 members currently actively there. It's called uh, Dragonfly South Asia Dragonfly group. So they actively share photos and uh, exchange views and other things. So these are the major uh, citizen science initiatives. And there is this, this uh, Dragonfly South Asia. Every year uh, we conduct workshops for students and other things so in different parts of India. So every year we, the workshops are conducted and several students participate. In addition to that, there is this small uh, state level groups are also there. Way. For example, in Kerala, there is a very active Dragonfly South Kerala group. So they regularly go for uh, field visits and do a lot of studies. And, a lot of people are involved and this this is across the stream so people are there are amateurs professionals there is a photographers there are people from business and people from journalism all group kind of people are there and actually Oh. Yeah, see, this one is, uh, you know, citizen science, because uh, if you uh, come to the Lepidoptera and other uh, Diptera, the uh, uh, the butterflies group, there are so many hobbyist yeah. groups are there everywhere in the world. And even if you look at the established park, like I have been to Kew Garden once, and they do have a beautiful, you know, butterfly park inside. So, but un unfortunately, I, th I don't think, is there any dragon or damselfly park inside our gardens? So yeah, have you ever uh, come across some kind of uh, that kind of gardens? No, no, no. I'll tell you what. The, the, there is a very interesting bit of history here. If you see the uh, history of butterfly popularization, no. So Winterblith uh, did 1950s. They had this uh, first field there. So people, the information was very much accessible to people, an easily accessible, easy language with lot of colorful pictures and other things. So uh, similarly for birds. So Salim Ali come, come up with. Uh, the uh, birds of Indian subcontinent, in uh, not birds of uh, book of Indian birds in 1940s. So with colorful pictures and other thing, and the language was very simplified, and people could access it even with the basic education. People could access it, and they could go out and do it. So such kind of literature was not available in uh, India until uh, 2004. So with the uh, uh, help of uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, we did a uh, India Livescape project. We did a first field guide on. Indian Dragonflies was in 2004, uh, published by uh, myself. Then uh, Vigyan Prasar again published in, uh, the, I, in a second version of that book in nine, 2009, if I remember correctly, again by me. So after that, it actually picked up and uh, uh, like availability of online information, also digital camera, accessible digital cameras and other things, encouraged a lot of people. So the only thing is that uh, we don't have like the, the the gap was the availability of uh, easily accessible information. So now that is coming up. So I think soon people will take up this. So similar is the case with other group, other groups also. Like for example, spiders or moths or um, trees or other things. So people need very easy accessible information and very good scientific information so that they can uh, take up and uh, do it. So uh, like if you look at the earlier studies most of the studies on indian animals were done by amateurs like for, and, and they wrote very wonderful uh, professional books almost either they were doctors or engineers or civil servants or who were like british people who were who had who were traveling across countryside and were documenting the natural wealth of the country we were all not professionals but they were all uh, having police officers so 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 all these kind of people have contributed to our knowledge so as you told in your presentation regarding the much brighter colors for the dragonflies and the damflies, they can see the ultra, they can sense the ultraviolet lights as well as the infrared yeah. radiations. So during the daytime, early morning, you can say noon time and the evening time. So these frequency of the ultraviolet rays as well as the infrared rays are you can say there's some variation along with the period of the duration of the time so in which part of the day 
they are highly active and what is the compatibility along with the intensity of the ultraviolet rays as well as the infrared at that particular time is there any correlation between these two things for maximum activity of the dragonfly ah, so as i told you they are all uh, cold blooded animals so they require a kind of temperature to have a very active fly so most of the dragonflies and damselflies in our indian situation they are active uh, from morning let us say at 9 o'clock to like when the sun is up and little warm from morning 9 o'clock to afternoon late afternoon they are very active when the temperature goes down they rest in some cool place or other thing and i i am not sure how the intensity of this ultraviolet or infrared is uh, influencing their behavior maybe i i, I am not come across uh, studies like that but if i come across i'll definitely inform you. but uh, the temperature plays an important role in their flight they require a minimum temperature to fly and in cold conditions and during winter their population is really reduced so you don't see many dragonflies and damselflies during winter time and especially so, are they are moving along with the air current or they are moving along with the sense of the food by using some chemicals how can no, they no, sense when, the food no 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 when they migrate when they migrate like across indian ocean when they migrate or when they, when they migrate in large uh, distances they use the air currents okay they can soar to a height and they can use migrate but when when they are chasing a prey when they are uh, when they are foraging when they are actively feeding they are not using the air current they actively fly so that's why they have very powerful uh, flight muscles so they actively pursue the prey and they can and if you you will be surprised their flight abilities are such that they can take off in 90 degrees i think no uh, sophisticated uh, flights can take off in 90 degree and they can uh, land also in 90 degree and in flight they can turn 180 degree while in flight and they can hover they can be in a place for a long time hovering they can uh, do this kind of uh, hovering and they can turn when they are in flight they can turn 180 degree so they come that kind of maneuverability they have. i think even the modern aircrafts don't have such kind of maneuverability and actually in fact lot of research on um, a dragon flight dragon flight flight is done by um, researchers on aerodynamics and for to develop better aircrafts and to do better drones so there is lot of research on dragon flies to develop similar uh, robots dragon fly size robot for surveillance and other so there is lot of research is happening on that front yeah felix Exciting field about the biomimetics, you know, the dragonflies inspired uh, mechanical design. That is an exciting field. I'm sure about it. Now okay. the question is coming from Ankit from Chandigarh. He is asking about any is there any cultural significance of dragonflies in Indian mythology or Indian history? And uh, while reading that question of Ankit, and I was just thinking about uh, my own experience in Japan. You know, the tombo that you you also mentioned the tombo in uh, Jap Japanese uh, uh, natural history collections. In Japan, the, the the dragonflies have a huge importance in culture. You know, the the, the akitsu uh, omatsuri that is actually the the the, the uh, you know the, the harvest festival. Is everywhere you can see the dragonflies flying around in Japan. So, do we have any any kind of uh, cultural significance in our epics? or mythology or any of these things so that is the question from my very interesting question so it varies from place to place for example you mentioned about tumbo so that tumbo word itself is very similar to malayalam word tumbi for a dragon okay so i think there is some main can connect maybe we don't know linguists can explore that one but uh, most of the people in india most of the people especially in plains believe that uh dragonflies are the indicators of rain so when you have large swarms of dragonflies coming you say that you are sure to have rain in one or two days so that is true in the sense that uh, i already told you they move with uh, monsoon winds or that thing. so they arrive just before one or two days before the monsoon so dragonflies large swarms of dragonflies they travel where the monsoon is going to come out so it is true and farmers believe that uh, dragonflies are indicators of monsoon. having said that i told you that dragonflies don't have much uh, cultural uh, in the sense there is no folklore or uh, or uh, stories associated with dragonflies in most of the peninsular india but that is uh, culturally very different from what is what we see in northeast india northeast india it's entirely different so the dragonflies are very integral part of their life in the northeast india 
and if you see uh, several of the dragonfly larva is consumed as food, as a source of food and if you, if they are sold in markets especially that large dragonfly larva is sold as a market like prawn is sold as a market it's a source of livelihood and income for several people especially in places like manipur and other places you can see that and uh, one of my student uh, did a study uh, actually it was an interview of uh, some 38 uh, tribes in manipur and uh, what they have for the, the the it was it was there are so many folklore songs myths associated with dragonflies in the state of manipur and the about and each and each of these uh, uh, indigenous people have their own stories and their own myths about dragonflies and most of these stories and myths are, are associated with harvest so there is harvest and rice harvest so many for example many believe that uh, many communities believe that the rice is fertilized by dragonfly so because they always fly above the uh, rising stock of paddy so when people believe that uh, rice is fertilized by uh, dragonflies and similarly there are uh, other stories also so there are poems um, and folk folk songs about dragonflies and The, the life of dragonfly, how it emerges from water into a new life. So uh, there is no such stories in other part of India. So I think it is very much uh, cultural, and there a lot of differences are there in different parts of India. Excellent, excellent. So I was just thinking about you. You said about Tombo and Tumbi. I never thought that. Yes, that's a. That, I think that's a very good parallelism. So maybe there is some historical connection here. So Tumbi, I don't know. Is it Tumbi in Tamil as well? The dragonfly in Malayalam is Tumbi. In Tamil is also Tumbi. Uh, Tumbi also. Tum Tumbi is an ancient, I think, Dravidian word for uh, dragonfly. Uh, Dravidian uh, word. Oh, very What exciting. I mean, uh, Japanese is also saying Tombo. Yeah. Yes. Uh. Yes. Vinay. Yes. So, what is the name in Hindi of the dragonfly in the dance? Chatur, uh, Chatur is used, but uh, Chatur is used. Chatur, mm. great. Chatur means very yeah. clever. <laughs> <laughs> so, next question is regarding the aquatic mites which are associated with the trunk of these dragonflies. So, is there any mutual association, or just mites is getting the beneficial? from to move from one aquatic uh, you can say reservoir to the another aquatic reservoir by using this as a transport vehicle it's a uh, parasitism and also as a transport oh. so the parasitism in the sense that they feed on hemolymph of the yeah. uh, dragonfly when they are attached and they also get transported from one aquatic habitat to another aquatic habitat so is there any chance to damage the whole dragonfly if it has much more amount of the mites which are attached with the trunk uh we have seen heavy infect in, 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 in infections but uh, definitely it is having uh, definitely it is having effect but i think detailed studies are required how it is affecting their reproductive fitness or anything so generally it is a uh, theorized in the evolutionary principle like if you have a heavy parasite load your chance of mating or your chance of getting selected for mating female sexual selection is very less so such kind of studies are not uh, done right so we have we, there is a lot of scope to do such studies but to look at the, a, a lot of lot of parasitism and whether the, they are having a uh, what you call detrimental effect on the reproductive fitness of the dragonfly so such kind of studies need to be carried out we have a question from ashutosh misra from orissa he is also quite active in this group and ashutosh question is that sir people in our village believe that if the damsel flies and flying termites fly in the sky there is a 100% chance of a rain and most of the cases it is true although not every time how this tiny creature sense the rain and why they fly in the sky before the rain most of them die that time that is a question from ashutosh okay so actually like uh, we human beings you know our uh, sense of um, sense of environment is very much limited and like uh, like our our chemical uh, the way we sense the number of uh, olfactory senses or our hearing uh, hearing senses or our even visual cues are very limited so but many of these organisms how they see the world in a totally different perspective because they are uh, like they are they for example i already told you they have a huge their visual spectrum is so vast so they can see several colors the what we don't see like they can see in infrared we cannot see in infrared they can see in ultraviolet we cannot see in ultraviolet But similarly they have sense of smell so they can smell things which we don't smell 
especially termites and other things and they they change in subtle changes in humidity i think we we even we can't change in subtle changes in humidity or temperature so many of these organisms can change and also some of these some are very much uh, what do you call i would say they are um, their reproduction it is associated with their especially the termite swarms it is associated with their reproduction so that is how they swarm and they go out and they mate and new thing so these are all very much um, hard way so they are genetically determined so they so they they have these natural cycles coming up so they develop these things and uh, like just before monsoon or after first summer showers they start developing these things gonads and other thing they and they develop things quickly and they just do that So similarly, dragonflies already told you they move with the winds. So what you see, dragonflies is that the the winds come just before, like one or two days before the rain clouds come. So they when they travel uh, before the rain clouds, naturally you see them much before the rain, and that is an advantage because they can uh, they know when the because they most of these dragonflies they complete their life cycle in a very short life uh, lifespan. So they breed in temporary water pools. So they need to occupy the Uh, water body so when the when the ponds get filled or when the puddles get filled they quickly they are already ready for the reproduction so their gonads are developed their ovaries are developed so as soon as the rain comes they just breed they fertilize their eggs and lay the larva lay the eggs and manage so this is all in very much interlinked and interconnected so yeah so then, i like that first part of your answer you're saying about uh, you know uh, about uh, being na- natural so i think it's something to do with our perils of modernity also you know most of the time we are uh, indoors yes. and you know we don't really go out you know three days back there was a un uh, observance called uh, you know the go barefoot day so we all wear the shoes even mm. you know why can't we go out in the park with barefoot you know we are actually running away from nature isn't it so i think maybe there is one reason that yes. we mm-hmm. cannot predict the rain yeah. no this is uh, especially contrasted when you like being uh, being most of the time in urban areas when you go to field and you when you travel with our uh, friends uh, indigenous community friends you could see them that they could they, they like we, we always go with our uh, friends uh, friends indigenous tribes who are uh, well aware of the forest why because of the few many seasons one is that they could sense sense the presence of many animals much before you their visual acuity or their audible or their sense of smell like they will say that elephant is nearby or there are some yeah. uh, some animal is nearby or they could see like um, like uh, what do you call uh, the snakes they could easily locate snake mm-hmm. or other thing this because of their very close interaction with the nature and they have they, they have they have fine tuned their uh, sense of all the senses very well so we are losing our those kind of uh, senses in quickly just because right. we are not i think we are not using that part of our brain like uh, yes. we have just shut off that brain and we are not using that so oh, i think uh, dr subramanam has already covered many questions as asked by the different uh, uh, listener and the viewers so but still one question that uh, that is in my mind so do you explain the reproductive potential of this dragonfly in the dam fly how much uh, eggs they release and how much chances of the their fitness for the next generation so you see during the adverse situation it's very difficult to identify a single dragonfly but during the favorable situation the number is uncountable so what is the reproductive potential of this dragon this particular group okay again it um... It, like it varies from species to species but when they lay eggs now they lay eggs in hundreds to like even thousand large dragonflies lay 2000 like x 3000 x another thing but the number of larva that is maturing into adult is very very less okay, so they lay large because lot of egg is lost in water some of the eggs are get predated larva is predated so the um, adult coming out of this um, larva Uh, larva is very very less so and also they disperse in large distances many of these commonly seen dragonflies they disperse in very far and wide places so when they disperse in, that is why like so even if there is no uh, like for example all the dra- uh, dragonflies went extinct locally in your campus me next season they will come from near bank they will come and colonize from nearby areas because the adults can fly very far not all dragonflies but Many commonly found dragonflies can disperse very far areas, and they also get. I already told you they get also get carried by this monsoon winds. So they get 
they get uh, what you call dispersed to a large distance. So we have a question from Aurelius from Nagaland, and Aurelius is asking: Studies show that damsel flies can learn to recognize predators from chemical cues. So, do you think damsel flies can be used as a model organism in study of chemosensory related experiments? If yes, then what would be the possible advantages? Okay. So, recent studies have shown that some of the damsel flies can uh, sense chemicals. But uh, because earlier it was mostly thought that since their antenna is very vestigial, so people thought that uh, uh, dragonflies and damselflies they mostly use visual cues for uh, their most of their day-to-day uh, -day activities. But some recent studies have shown that they can sense chemicals at least. But if you look at the uh, antenna of dragon, dragonflies and damselflies, it is not as sophisticated as a uh, antenna of a fly. Or a other organism, other insect which use like for a butterfly or a our housefly or a Drosophila, which uses most of the olfaction as a major uh, source of their cues, environmental cues, because they don't have many sensillas, what we call it in the like chemical sensillas. Like you, there are several kind of sensillas out there, and this this uh, olfactory cues of damselflies and damsel dragonflies mostly work in near, not in far away places, like only in and near places, like just very close by locations. But if you look at the antenna of a butterfly or a moth or a, a fly, they they work in a very large distances. Even I will I will like I will not be surprised to say even in kilometer scale it will work. For example, carrion flies, which locate the dead bodies, okay, mm -hmm. in, from very 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 far very very far distances they can locate dead bodies and exactly come to that point and lay eggs. So or for example, even the moths, which locate which locate their mate by pheromones, they can locate it from kilometers together. So such kind of uh, powerful uh, chemosensory cues are not there. But dragonflies are extensively used to study uh, uh, visual cues or visual visual because their eyes are very well developed. And so I already told you they have so many auxin proteins. About 30 auxin proteins are there, which was very recently discovered. So they are very much used for uh, visual study. So dragonflies and damselflies are good model system for studying vision, insect vision, not as an insect, chem chemos chemosensory. Chemosensory, you could use moths or a fly or a, those are much better studied systems. So there is another question from my side, sir. that is, I think, relevant or not relevant, I don't know, actually. So do you differentiate uh, grasshopper from the locust? And how could they camp from the eastern Africa up to the India so how can their life cycle match with such a long distance? Okay, so this locust is a kind of um, grasshopper only. We call uh, locust is a large grasshopper, Schistocerca gregariatus. But they all come into the same family. So actually, if you look at, we have two third locust. Okay. And other locust, what we have is that Bombay locust it is called. Okay, this is called uh, uh, Schistocerca gregaria, and other one, Bombay locust is called Padanga succinata. So this um, Schistocerca gregaria have a natural distribution from entire um, uh, that Africa up to Indian subcontinent, and it covers several countries, some 69 to 70 countries. It has natural distribution. So even um, during our uh, normal days when there is no swamp, no locust swamp, there are small populations of locust everywhere. Like even in like your uh, Western India, like Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Madhya Pradesh, all those dry areas, semi-arid tract of India, you have small populations of locust always is there. And, but they don't become swamps, but they are all very small population. And these kind of scattered populations are there throughout their range. So what happens is that, uh, this during this uh, some favorable environmental conditions like rainfall and other thing, temperature and other thing, they start breeding profusely. Like after like this, I told you this cycle happens about roughly about 30 years, and they start breeding profusely, and they form swarms, large swarms. And because of the depletion of the food in one place, they start moving to other places from one place to another. So that is how this swarm. So the current episode of this uh, locust swarm started somewhere in Sudan, that is the horn of Africa. Sometimes uh, 
2019 uh, February, if I remember correctly. So from that time, the swamp started. And the, from that time, we had a warning that this is going to build up, build up because of the uh, environmental conditions are favorable, especially there was a lot of rainfall in other all these Arabian things and other things. So a lot of profuse growth of vegetation is there. So this will build up, build up, and they will slowly come to this. So this is a natural cycle. So that happens. So every like 30 years or so this is this episodes of this one happen. All right, we have a question from Amit asking from Telangana, what is known about existing cross kingdom symbiosis between these groups of bacteria and plants and fungi? So yeah, odontata with bacteria, plants and fungi, is there any exciting cross kingdom symbiosis? Oh, recent studies have shown that uh, there is no like species specific um, bacteria or fungi or something. So uh, generally they get infected from what is they feeding on. There is no like unique gut, gut uh, flora or a gut microbial flora associated what is found in some insect groups. That kind of uh, uniqueness is not there, but usually they get infected from what they are feeding on and it is not is not there is nothing specific. I think more research is like maybe required to look at for wool bacteria or some kind of these uh, microbes, say microbial associations, but not much is done on that front. We have one more question. Uh, it's from Shefali Patel. She's asking from Gujarat. Is there any singing system in these flies to communicate with each other in their community? Or rather, she's asking, how do the dragonflies communicate? Oh, there is no audio, like auditory communication, what you see in like the grasshoppers, crickets, or cicadas, that kind of group. But what you have is mostly visual communication. So they're very much uh, brightly colored. So they identify their mate or predator or uh, prey or by, by through vision. So they have very good, uh, I already told they have very good color and mostly by visual communication. Only they, uh, they have, like, uh, they are, some of them have very bright colored wings to. Uh, like especially males have very bright color wings to advertise themselves or to tell them uh, upon specific that they are holding the person. Yet another question coming from Chennai. Deepika, Deepika is asking, is uh, sir, is the stings of these insects toxic? If yes, how much poison it is and what kind of damage will it create to the human body? Okay, so they don't have stings and uh, they, they are not poisonous but some large dragonflies what they have they are called anal appendages so they are like feasers so when you catch them they will just try to hold you but it is not uh, it's not uh, sufficient pressure to pain or give anything but they are not poisonous or they don't have any uh, stings or anything. okay well uh, there is another question from nikita here how do dragonfly larvae survive underwater for nearly two years? Okay, so they can breathe uh, dissolved oxygen. So they have the gills, uh, I mentioned you. So they are gills in the last abdominal segment and they can breathe through the day. They can take dissolved oxygen. So they don't need to come out of the water. And it, it happens just by simple uh, diffusion because of the small body size and, and they can do uh, and they have very network uh, vessel, blood vessel, so they do that. So there is another question that is asked by the Kesar Ahmed. Uh, he asked that uh, how some dragonflies lay eggs in the salt water and what is the mechanism that help to withstand these eggs in such a hypertonic solution? Um, but as far as uh, we know, there is no, uh, all the uh, dragonflies are freshwater dragonflies only. And uh, there is only two species of dragonflies that can lay eggs in uh, estuarine or uh, saline water that is found in, uh, in Southeast Asia and another species is found in the America. So uh, other than these two species, all other dragonfly species are aquatic, uh, freshwater dragonflies. So they don't they, they don't lay eggs in uh, uh, they don't lay eggs in hypersaline water or hypertonic water okay. and 
in nine natural conditions. And having said this, uh, just for information, if you look at all insects, there are no insects in the sea. Okay, all the insects are either terrestrial or subwater. Okay, there is only one insect which has successfully colonized. There is one bug, aquatic bug. Okay, called halobates, which has colonized the pelagic habitat. Okay, so that is the only species which can live. It's on the water surface, and all of the insects, most of the insects, are terrestrial, and they live in freshwater. And this has to do with the evolution of angiosperms. Also, like you may be knowing that the the insects evolve. Explosive diversification of insects happen along with the diversification of angiosperms, and this has to do with the like evolutionary arms race and uh, their mutualism and how they develop the uh, pollination mechanisms and they got associated. So it was a kind of uh, uh, what you call evolutionary arms race and also mutualism and symbiosis developed. So almost all the insects except for this uh, halobates all are terrestrial and freshwater. So maybe the same reason you have maximum I think other than the sea grasses all the angiosperms are uh, either freshwater or terrestrial. Like angiosperms also you, you hardly see it. like purely marine there are no angiosperms other than this uh, sea grasses. Oh, I never knew that. You know, insects are mostly terrestrial, so it's very new information, exciting information for me as well. I was thinking the zooplanktons are in zooplanktons uh, insects. I mean, uh, zooplanktons are everywhere in the ocean. Aren't you call them as insect? Or so, which group are they? No, no. Zooplanktons is a very uh, general term. It is a, I would say, mm -hmm. it is a, uh, it is a calling vague term. term. No, no, vague. In the vague term, in the sense, it has, it is actually. Uh, these are all free floating larval stages of crustaceans, molluscans, some may like this nidar, this sponges, nidarians, other things, which are very young stages or larval stages. But there are also uh, planktonic crustaceans like uh, Gladocera, Ostracorsa. These are all planktonic crustaceans, very small, tiny crustaceans of it. But in addition to that, you also have all this. So it is a mixture of several things. Zooplankton is a mixture of it's a class term. It is not a uh, sci scientifically. It is not a defined term. It's a class term for their behavior, like free floating organisms. But there are no. We have um, arthropods. Yes, they are, okay. they are. They are not arthropods. So insects are not. So in my childhood, I watched many movies in which a dragon, a very very big dragonfly came on the land and even can capture the human and can go upward direction. <laughs> so my, my question is very simple that some question also, some student also asked the similar question. So they are the earlier, you can say primitive dragonfly and present dragonfly. There are a lot of the difference actually, including in their size also. So what is the reason behind it? And can we replicate those things, those conditions again, so we can increase the, you can say, size of the dragonfly? Actually, like, uh, see, you may be aware that over the millions of years, the Earth's oxygen, atmospheric oxygen has reduced. Okay, from the, like, what that is what several studies have shown. So, like as you told you, like they, they, are, they are most of the invertebrates, not just dragonflies, the size of them have reduced over the millions of years because the, when you have a high oxygen partial pressure, it is easy for you to diffuse into all the body parts. Okay, when you have uh, oxygen partial pressure of ox atmospheric oxygen is less, it is very difficult to reach to all the body parts and tissues. So, uh, as the oxygen level reduced over the years, the size of several organisms also got reduced especially the invertebrates because like unlike vertebrates they they don't have the mechanism of lungs and to transport oxygen to the, they don't have the like the oxygen carrying uh, mechanisms of what we have in vertebrates and other things so actually most of this uh, oxygenation of tissues and body parts ha happens through diffusion simple diffusion so what happened is that all the like you have you had giant millipedes giant uh, uh, other organisms also to all got reduced over the years because of the reduction in oxygen level. Okay, we so, here is a question from Srijit Sri Kumar from Pune, and Srijit is asking: Other than Africa, India migration to Pantala flavescence migrate in other parts of the globe, 
are there other ordinates who have such wide migratory patterns oh yes there are several species which migrate not just pandala flavicens uh, pandala flavicens is migrate because you see in large numbers okay so like large swarms you see that is why it has captive captivated people but you should understand that it is not that all dragonflies migrate in swarms there are several species which migrate in small populations individuals other things so in europe there are species which migrate okay there are species which migrate uh, like not across oceans but across land species migrate several species migrate and it is not just the pandala flavicens that migrate across oceans and there are uh, people have observed other species also which move with the pandala flavicens also but not in large numbers of course and pandala flavicens being a circum tropical species they they hope from one place to another it is not that they they, they like circum tropical like they use entire tropical areas to move around yes we have a question from nikita here and nikita is asking dragonflies needs to warm up in the sun before the flight why is it so their thorax needs to reach 25 degrees celsius before the flight can you comment on that yes as as you may be aware most of these uh, what do you call cold blooded animals not like what you call like insects most of the insects butterflies or uh, other insects also they require a temperature to they have to be active because they get the energy from sunlight to get minimum minimum energy is required to uh, for their body to warm up and then they start flying so they require like let us say 25 degree maybe some studies but it depends on the species and the size of the dragonfly like small dragonfly may not require that much size than the large dragonflies so different species varies but generally they they the body need to be warm so they fly in warm temperature and they can't fly in very high temperature also because they get desiccated so they they lose their water and they so they do what they do is that they optimize so they can't be in sun for long time because they get des desiccated because they also need to be cool so that's why they fly in a time that uh, their temperature is optimum for them this is the case with uh, most of the uh, cold blooded animals even the reptiles you might have seen snakes and lizards dinal lizards warming up basking what we call as basking so uh, bask they bask and they like stuff Okay, Nikita here is asking one more question. Fossils of dragonfly showed a wingspan of nearly two feet. Exactly, the comment by Vinay is also the same, similar comment. And uh, yes, uh, you know the childhood days, uh, the the movies and the fictions. Now it is two point five inches. Can we grow super sized dragonflies in the lab by creating special chambers mimicking oxygen levels from three hundred million years ago? <laughs> That's a very curious question. Now. Yeah, nice question. But see, like you may be aware. that there are genetic constraints okay so uh, there is something called design in biology you know? like you cannot have like it is like though people say like in movies and all it is nice like fiction there is something called biomechanics there is something called genetic constraint there is something called blueprint like bow plant they call in evolution so that you are there is a design like when you are when you when something is made there is a genetic design like for example it's a very fascinating thing to know how your left and right half is perfectly developed in your like it's if you think it's a very complex phenomenon like how your right and left fingers are developed you know like it's genetically how we, how it is programmed so similarly how the left wing and right wing of a dragonfly or any anything even the simplest animal you take how it is like especially bilaterally symmetrical animals you take how this two sides are similarly developed and evolved even for a flower symmetrically how these things are developed so there is a very very a tight um, genetic programming is there to which you cannot break it like it is though it is very uh, uh, people think that it can be done like this it's all science fiction or it is found in like a very fancy not a good science fiction very bad science fiction i would say it is there is a genetic constraint and it, which cannot be broken so but artificially you may uh, be able to like you cannot uh, so you can increase size by giving more food and other thing but it cannot be grown beyond a limit like you cannot be, like human beings you can make obese human being but it is you cannot make like a 15 feet tall person or a, or a okay okay we have one more question coming from ramesh uh, ramesh is from dehradun 
Hello. Ah, hi, sir. Would you like to make a comment? No, Ramji, no, sir. You, please, please. I'm sorry. I could not attend earlier. No, 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 no problem. No, no, but yes, please sir. go ahead with the yes, students' sir. question first. I will ask in the end. One, one curious. I mean, I will. One curious. Oh, sir. Curious. All right. So Ramesh is asking from Daradun. I think it's a very pertinent question to you, sir. And this is about which reference will you recommend to identify dragonflies and damselflies from India? Are there any dichotomous identification case? Which database will you suggest to check the existing diversity of these groups? Okay. So, so where the is the question? Basic uh, literature you should have is that there is this phone uh, uh, of British India three-volume book on uh, dragonflies and damsel uh, dragonflies of. India, India, and India, Burma, and Ceylon. Okay, so it's called Ordinata, Ordinata Volume One, Two, and Three by Fraser. So that is the most fundamental books, and this is very exhaustive and very scientifically printed book. But after that, there are several uh, papers and other things. But this is the most comprehensive book, and there are several uh, field guides available online also. Some of them are can download freely also to identify dragonflies and damselflies, and um, Uh, easily identify and the websites yes we asked there is one um, like world ordinator checklist maintained by uh, martin and uh, ford so that you can refer which is regularly updated and other thing and there are several um, regional uh, checklists are there but for india we have uh, there is a website called uh, indianordinator.org that is a very good website where you can look at all the species photos there are several species photos regularly updated and also if you see that uh, the facebook group i told you and uh, ordinate of uh, south asia dragonfly south asia group it is called so there is also several photos and other things are there so all these things will um, uh, like will give you the very good background to start your work on yes sir over to you uh, professor paramjit paramjit sir sir Uh, Dr. Subramaniam, thank you for your. Uh, I I could just enter at the um, end of the uh, session, uh, but I have only one curiosity. We what uh, one project which we were doing jointly, uh, BSI that is say on Himalayas. Uh, can you throw some light on? I don't know whether this question has been earlier asked by anybody or not. Whether dragonflies can be used as a indicator of climate change, or can they? Because as you know, as you have told yourself that they are cold-blooded, and they they must be uh, very sensitive to the temperature changes. So, is there any such study done on Himalayas or any other part of the country about the, whether they can be uh, indicator of any climate change? Uh, second part is, uh, do uh, ha- we have un- uh, understood the inter? action between uh, angiosperms and dragonflies uh, in in uh, i mean different habitats species wise specialized i mean studies uh, has been done on that or not and are we are we now mm, uh, sure how many species are there dragonflies in india or there you feel there's still a lot of uh, new things you can expect or uh, how much you expect is still un- undiscovered in uh, this uh, particular group thank you dr Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for asking that interesting question. Uh, first, I will come to that Himalaya study. So, that uh, Himalaya we recorded about uh, 200 and entire Himalaya belt from Kashmir to Arunachal, about 250 species of dragonflies. So, this includes some historical records also. Now, we have a very good uh, database on their altitudinal distribution. so what species are found at what altitude and other thing since there was no uh, benchmark studies earlier so uh, but what we are seeing is that several uh, species that is found in the low altitude which is very uh, very much adapted to warm conditions are now found even at a much higher elevation so indicating it that several species have started moving up in himalaya so what happens is that there are several species Uh, i already told you about the relic himalayan dragonfly the epiophilia laidlaw so these are the species which are highly specialized in high altitude areas my about 3000 meters so there are species which are living in uh, this high alpine uh, areas or cold water areas or they don't have much anywhere to go like if the t- temperature warms up or anything they can't go much higher because there is no habitat there or anything so right. these are the species that will be affected especially when the climate warms up or other thing and other thing is that several of these generalist species what we say very common species and very widespread species started have started moving up also because of the uh, uh, 
loss of habitat or degradation of habitat, especially streams and other things when they become uh, degraded or when they become polluted. Several of these species which are very much um, adapted to uh, general conditions or very uh, adapted to uh, polluted conditions have started colonizing these habitats. So, but I think we need uh, much more continuous monitoring to look at which are the species and other things. But we have a good idea of which are the species that are indicators of good habitat and which are in Himalaya also. Throughout India, we have a good uh, data on which are the species which indicate uh, good habitat quality and other things. So that is the first answer. The second question you are talking about the uh, association of angiosperms and the uh, dragonflies. So especially uh, there are no, like unlike uh, phytophagous insects, like unlike butterflies, moths or other insects which have a very direct uh, connection mm -hmm. because they require a specific uh, host plant either for feeding or egg laying. Uh, this, uh, the dragonflies are not phytophagous, they are purely all predator, either larval or other stages. So, but how angiosperms are in use in the dragonfly studies is that uh, several of these um, uh, habitats, like especially for meristica swamps, you might have heard about meristica mm -hmm. swamps in the southern western Ghats, are the primitive habitats, primitive forest, I would say, are also habitat for very specialized dragonflies and damselflies. So they are not found outside meristica swamps. So they are they are highly evolved within meristica swamp also. So they require that habitat only inside meristica swamp only or uh, meristica asso swamps associated with streams. So similarly, there are these. Um, uh, peat box in high altitude, you have this peat box. Are there. So there are damsel flies found only in peat box. So that kind of association is there. So they, these angiosperms create specific habitats, Habitat. habitats for this group of organisms. So what was your, there was one more question you had asked me, sir. I mean, uh, uh, can you say now that we know uh, at least taxonomy yeah, yeah. Oh, about so, all the dragonflies and this damn fly. Uh, so I already told you the morphological uh, taxonomy is um, like of Indian dragonflies uh, is like base work is very well done. Okay, so uh, we know the species groups and other things, but still uh, people are discovering. So every year there is five, six species are described and most of these species discoveries are from remote part of India where people are not much done exploration for Northeast India or from the Andaman or Nicobar Islands, remote islands of Nicobar where people are not, uh, not uh, so currently we have about uh, uh, 493 species of dragonflies and damselflies recorded, but still maybe another 30-40 uh, species will be easily added in, the, in this list. So this year itself we are hoping to describe another uh, 10 species from uh, from mostly from Nicobar, Western Ghats, or Eastern Himalaya. So such things are in process. But mostly these discoveries are by uh, by like uh, surveying in very remote areas where people are not ventured into the farm. But also there is another kind of discovery is there. But what people thought earlier as uh, as a, what you call variation or as a, a synonymy. Now we are discovering them to be valid species largely because earlier people studied only museum samples. They are not mm -hmm. actually seen the species in field and collected the fresh samples. So people have looked at museum samples or uh, without color or without uh, much character. But when we see uh, museum uh, fresh samples from the field and also collect, do detailed study, those species are being re-erected. So what we say like from the synonymy it is removed and validity system. So that kind of discovery is also there. Good. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Subramaniam, for uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, forenoon spending with us in Tangled Bank. We are really indebted to you. It Thank was you. really a nice presentation. You have covered so many things about the taxonomy as well as the general significance of this uh, less known group of Odonata. Uh, yeah, we are really humbled to you, sir, for Thank coming you. coming with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'll switch off now. Yeah. Uh, Shall I leave now? Uh, no, I think yeah, he, he will he will disconnect from the uh, yeah. I will I will disconnect. He can remain yes. very. He can very, remain in the group for talk. a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So thanks everybody for uh, being uh, with us today.
and uh, the next talk is at 2 30 pm instead of 3 30 please be aware of it so we are starting at 2 30 pm today and it is by rajiv rakhavan from kofos he's going to talk on fishes the the secret life you know i would say this really interesting story that he's going to share with you all uh, it's about uh, endemic fishes of the western cards and other places in india and uh, forthcoming talks in this series is by Tarun Arora. Professor Tarun is going to talk on biodiversity loss 9.30 a.m. tomorrow, followed by Anindida Padra from Mysore, Kolkata. She is going to talk on dogs in urban ecology at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And then finally, by Professor R.K. Kohli, our Vice Chancellor, he will talk on biodiversity and conclude the session, followed by the valedictory function. So I will see you all at 2.30 p.m. today. Thank you for listening and have a nice uh, afternoon.